something a bit closer to our own experience. I have now a couple of two final slides on planets. Because also planets emit X-rays. We know, of course, from our Earth, we know that the auroras of the Earth is actually a source of the, the X-ray emission. And this is due to the fact that the auroras are produced by electrons moving very fast in the magnetic fields of the Earth. So there are all the elements for producing X-rays, uh, uh, fast electrons, magnetic fields at their strongest in the close to the poles. And indeed, what I show on the left side in this plot is the aurora of the Earth as measured by the integral ESA spacecraft a couple of years ago. But auroras can be seen also in other planets, for instance, in Jupiter. And what I show here on the right side are plots of the aurora on the Jupiter on the north side and on the south side. And these measurements were taken by several spacecraft in the infrared, in the X-rays, among them also XMM-Newton. And the interesting in these uh, measurements that uh, warranted another publication in Nature last year is that the aurora in the north and in the south, they are completely different. They are different in shape and they are also different in their time evolution. And this was unexpected. I'm not an expert in the field. But people expert in the field told me that typically the aurora on the Earth are very similar in the north and in the south. And this is actually something that does, seem to be, does not seem to be reproduced on the planets, in the other planets of the solar system, and we don't understand why yet. And finally, X-rays coming from the star, the stars could actually have an impact on the question of where actually there is life beyond, in the universe beyond the Earth. Because we expect that there are uh, many planets in the universe that are in principle in the habitable zone, so in the region which is not too hot or not too cold and can actually sustain uh, the existence of life as on our Earth. But whether actually the, they can sustain life in reality depends also on the X-ray activity of the, st of the sun, of the star around which they, they rotate. Because we are lucky in the sense that our sun is relatively old, is um, almost 10 to the 10 years old, and therefore it's, there was a sufficient time in its history for the X-rays from its corona to decay significantly. So now the X-ray emission of the corona is too low to be harmful for the Earth. So essentially they are not sufficient influx of its ray photons capable to going through our thick atmosphere. But uh, something like uh, um, um, 20 million years ago, uh, sorry, two, 200 million years ago, is correct what I'm saying? Uh, yes. Uh, the sun was actually much more active. And so our sun is a G star. So if you look at this plot, on the plot you see on the x-axis the age of a star and on the y-axis the X-ray luminosity. And you see actually the stars whose age is of the order of 10 to the 8 years, which means 100 million solar years, they are actually very active in X-rays. So life could have not probably emerged on the Earth if our sun would have been would be so active. So this is important because this allows us to select among potential planets that can host life, those where it, life is unlikely due to the strong radiation field from the star, the star around which they orbit. So that was my last slide. I have just uh, yeah, two final comments that I can very shortly summarize. First of all, I think I convinced you, I hope I convinced you, that uh, X-rays and gamma rays are the tool to investigate very energetic phenomena in the universe. And this can apply to any kind of, um, well, any kind is too strong to say, but many kind of celestial objects. From galaxy and galaxy clusters and black holes in galaxies, allowing us to um, reconstruct or to study the cosmological history of the universe, two objects in our own galaxy, 
galaxies uh, to black holes and neutron stars uh, to normal stars and even uh, planets in our galaxy and even investigate the habitability of Earth-like planets. And the second message I would like to conclude my talk with is that we have uh, spacecraft uh, flying. Our spacecraft or the European Space Agency has been operating almost two decades. They continue to be scientifically very successful. They produce of the order of one paper per day on uh, these kind of topics. And they are open observatories. Everybody can apply for their time. And, you know, don't be shy. If you think you have a very good idea on how to use uh, the time of this observatory for your own uh, research, for your own scientific question, for your own curiosity, feel free to apply for time. Ask me if you want to learn how to do it. And that's uh, close my talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Matteo, for, for that. I stop sharing my screen now. Okay, if uh, someone have a question. Yes, uh, me, myself. Okay, you uh, could uh, start. I'm Taisir Nafti, a member of the Tunisian Association of Young Astronomers. So thank you, uh, sir, for your presentation. It was brilliant, and uh, we've learned so many things uh, interesting about the universe. Uh, well, I have one question. Uh, my question is, which uh, criteria that we use to differentiate between or to correlate the black hole and the galaxy branch? Sorry, which? Which criteria we use to correlate the, the black hole and the galaxy branch? Well, what you mean uh, from the statistical point of view or... Uh, or uh, As a physical uh, point of view. Ah, I well, ah, oh, that's a good question. Yes, yes, yes. So, essentially, the idea behind it is that there is a way for uh, the black hole to have an impact on the interstellar medium and therefore regulate the formation of the star. The idea is that at the beginning, uh, we don't know actually who forms first, the big black hole or the big galaxy, but essentially the black hole evolves and by evolving at some point it reaches a sufficient uh, um, uh, rate of growth that it can emit strong wind. 